Hi everybody, I'm Luke Hector from The Broken Meeple and if you can, after this video, please remember to subscribe to the channel and like and comment on this video with your thoughts. I appreciate that you take the time to watch the content and I like to hear what you have to say. And if you want to help that channel just that little bit more, the Patreon campaign is always running if you want to keep this channel going for the foreseeable future. So on today's episode, we're doing a full review of Stroganoff. Now this came out on Kickstarter, I think 2021 time, but I was a little bit like, mm, I don't know. I was slowing down my Kickstarter buys at that time. If you looked at my February purchases, that's completely gone out the window. But I was like, well, it looks pretty. Not the first theme I'd go for, but I don't know. Game Brewers put out some nice stuff. What about Andrea Steading? What about that? And it's like, so I looked down the designer's game list, and there's a couple there which I think are pretty good. There's a couple there which I think are meh. And there's one or two that I want to see burn in the fires of hell. Oh, come on! So I decided to hold back on the whole Kickstarter purchase and think, you know what? I'll grab it on retail and see what it's like then. The question is, should I have backed it on Kickstarter? Was I right to wait for retail or... Should I just scrapped it entirely? Let's find out. In the 16th century, a family of merchants and entrepreneurs by the name of Stroganov attracted the attention and favor of the Tsar. Wishing to use their wealth and power, he granted the Stroganovs lands and privileges with which to continue their enterprises. Near the end of the century, the Tsar enlisted the Stroganovs' help to extend Russia's reach into Siberia. In Stroganov, you'll play as members of the powerful Stroganov family, urging your Cossack hunters to explore eastward into Siberia. In the fairer weather of spring, summer and autumn, your Cossacks will explore, hunt for valuable furs and establish outposts. As they travel, they'll gather stories to turn into songs to be sung by the fire when they return home for the long, harsh winters. Your growing influence in Russia depends on the continued favor of the Tsar. Fulfill his wishes in Siberia to sustain your power and bring honor to the Stroganov name. Each of the four rounds of the game represents one year. Each of these years consists of four turns representing the seasons. In the spring, summer and autumn turns, you will advance across the varied landscapes of Siberia, hunting furs, visiting villages and yurts, establishing outposts, fulfilling the Tsar's wishes and gathering stories of your epic adventures. Players will take turns to move across a selection of landscape tiles in order to gather the furs that they require in order to perform actions and score points, as well as fulfilling the Tsar's wishes. The furs are numbered from two to eight and are very specific. You you can't substitute one fur for another. If a card requires you to gather three furs of level two, you need three furs of level two. However, there are some little workarounds that you can do with money in order to get through that problem. Your general turn involves basic and advanced actions. Basic actions involve just taking various resources that you might want to use, as well as hunting for furs. The advanced actions involve visiting the various villages, yurts, building outposts, fulfilling Tsar's wish cards, and claiming landscape tiles for set collection bonuses. During the winter season of each year, you will return home to the starting tile, receive income, weave your stories into song, and reset for the following year. At the end of the fourth year, endgame scoring takes place, and the player with the most victory points wins. Of course! So the duration of Stroganov really depends on the player count here, in a good and bad way. If you play this solo or with two players, you can get the game done in around 90 minutes max, which is actually a pretty good length for this game, which kind of goes into the whole midway Euro category. Sort of ushering on to maybe the heavier side, but it's still pretty midway. But then when you add more players, wow does the time escalate. Three is bearable. Four, especially for your first game, is long. It's quite a long affair, like two and a half hours or so, possibly more in your first game. And a lot of that problem comes from the way turns are done. You move your character, you perform an action, and then you decide whether you want to perform the same kind of basic action or an advanced action and various other shenanigans. The problem is, every player does their whole turn before the next player does, and because there's quite a bit to plan ahead for, like, okay, I'm going to do this action, which is going to get me these furs, and then I can use these furs to transfer onto that card, which gets me this bonus that I can use for this, AP sets in quite heavily. There is certainly a lot of chances for people to just freeze up at the start of their turn thinking, well, hang on, I need these furs. I don't have any money, but I need to go to the market and get more. So how do I do this? And worse still, the market where you can get furs and kind of, well, you don't exchange, you effectively buy them from the market and they replenish, they replenish straight away. As in straight out of the bag into the market which then causes people to freeze up again because then you're looking at this market and going, oh, that did now come out. A freeze just come out. But well, that means I can now do this, which, hang on, let me just think about that. 
The downtime does get to silly levels. In fact, we now house rule that the market does not replenish until the end of your turn for that very reason. There is certainly a little bit too much downtime when you get to the high player count. So certainly I think off the top of my head, this kind of feels more like a solo and two player game. Three and four is just if you really want other people there. The game doesn't change dramatically when you add more players in other than time, frankly. Setup can also be a little bit of a chore. There's a lot of A and B segments of cards, tiles, and that includes songs, that includes the Yurt tiles, that includes uh, the Zar cards. There's a lot of A's and B's that you gotta sort through at the start of the game. And the fur bag? Hey, that's gonna grind after a while. You basically have to lay out all these landscape tiles and you have to populate them with furs, depending on the player count. But you have to draw them out of the bag and then you have to put them on the tile, different numbers for different tiles, and then you have to arrange them in numerical order from start to finish. That takes a while in the setup to the point where I want to like, you know, I, I feel like I just want to like use my own skin rather than draw fur out of the bag because I feel that would be easier and quicker. You're sick! It is a bit of a grind on the setup and bear in mind during the game when you get into winter phase you're going to have to refill some of those tiles again with other furs. The ones you've claimed that is. But this say, during the game it's not so bad. You just got to accept that there's probably a little bit of a lengthy setup for a midweight Euro, just some fiddly aspects here and there. And then of course, lots of downtime, as I said before, the duration can get a little bit too far. I'd almost compare it to something like Lewis and Clark. If you've ever played that game, a lot of people will say that they love the game, and it is a good game, but they tend to keep it at two players max. This feels a bit like that. Now the rule book for Stroganov is a bit of a dark horse, it tricks you. Because when I first read this and thought, right, I'm comfortable enough to teach it, I thought, you know what, this is a pretty decent rule book. There's a lot of pictorial examples. Everything seems to be laid out in a good logical sequence, you know, do the movement, then the basic action, then the advanced actions, you know, and it's got a decent layout for the most part. So for 90% of this book, I can say it's a very good rule set. But then some cracks started to appear, mostly brought up by friends of mine actually, when they asked me for specific rulings and I had to reference them in the book. It's like, ah. Referencing in this book is a little bit on the hit and miss. Now a lot of the little rules that you've got, like how do you convert into the market, how does this, how many horses does it take to buy a tile, that kind of thing, are actually on the board itself, and I approve of this. Once you get used to the iconography, of which there is quite a bit, you do get some of those rules in your head. But there are a couple of fails that this rule book has done, which I got to bring up, and I'm sorry, but you know, these are fails. They, the book has a habit of doing note sections in italics and red text. Now normally when you've got that in a rule book, you think, okay, that's gonna be for the, the weird obscure stuff that's not that important, but you know, maybe it's just a reminder to jog your memory. Oh no, this book likes to use those as actual rules and puts them as notes. For example, there is a period during the game when you're supposed to replace tiles, like all the A tiles, you're supposed to scrap them all, and then you're meant to replace them with the B sections. That's not in the main body of text. It's in a red note banner, like a, a red note italic thing. No, it's not just a note, it's a fundamental rule of the game, and trust me, because we got that rule slightly wrong on our first game, it can fundamentally affect your enjoyment if you don't get that right. It's just little things like that. Not to mention those other aspects like the tiger tiles are literally just like a sort of blue box bit in the middle of nowhere in basic action, which is kind of an odd place to put it, and then they're never mentioned ever again. So if you don't know the tiger tiles are there, you don't know how they work. It's There's just a, a few little nitpicks here when it comes to referencing and the notes, but all in all, you do get a decent reference guide on the back for the iconography. The iconography is fairly straightforward, in a way, kind of intuitive in places, and the rule book, other than those blemishes, is generally good. So I can't be too harsh today, but I did have to bring up one or two of those little things that are kind of like, ah, oh, you were almost perfect, you were almost there. But as I say, they are nitpicks. Where the engagement factor rolls up though is when you are trying to think how you're gonna use these furs in the best way to get what you need. Because all the Tsar wish cards and all the various other things you do like claiming landscape tiles depending on what region you're in all require specific number furs. And if you don't have those specific numbers you need to find a way to either convert the ones you have or get those ones whether it's from the market or from some other bonus. And so you are kind of planning ahead several turns thinking well, let's see, I'm gonna end up in, region, in that region which is gonna need 
six level furs. So can I get any sixes now? Well, I could from the market if I do this. So maybe I should go to this village, grab myself a couple of sixes from there, and then later on when I get to that region, then I can use those sixes for something else. Question is, can I use some of these low ones now? Well, if I spend them where I am, I could do another action here. There's a lot of that going on, hence the AP from earlier. But it is engaging and it is good fun. And the turns do flow quite smoothly, albeit a little bit slowly, in terms of downtime when you are going from season to season, but the game does get a little bit rinse-repeat as you go through. You're playing through four different rounds, and the rounds play out pretty much identical, aside from the idea of using the B side of tiles instead of the A ones. So there's not really a sense of like ultimate progression, it's just more a case that you might have unlocked a couple of abilities with the Tsar Wish cards, and you might have a little bit of income going, but it's not like the game dramatically changes when you get near the end. And that asymmetricalness is compounded if you dare use the asymmetrical sides of the boards. I never thought I'd say this ever, but I'm gonna say it. This is the first game ever for me to go do not use the asymmetrical powers. What? Yeah, I'm serious because firstly, well two main reasons. Firstly, they're rubbish. They are like the most basic of asymmetrical powers ever. It's literally just a track you have on the front of your board and it changes how it slightly looks and how what bonuses it gives you. That's it. Whippy. It really is nothing more than just a, a weird iteration of a track. Whoopee! It's like, whatever. But it also introduces a, a rule where when you max out on the story track, you get to level up on the trophy track again. This breaks the game fundamentally. Because when you are in normal game, you don't level up the trophy track by this method if you max out storytelling. So it's harder to level up the trophy track. In the asymmetrical mode though, it's super easy. All you gotta do is spam story points get to the max level, spend what you need to go up on the trophy track, and then you just gain a few more story points and you do it again. But because every time you level up on the trophy track, you get a cool bonus, which is really useful, you can chain a ton of effects in the turn. Not only does this introduce AP like crazy, it also means that there's more downtime between turns as all this stuff keeps chaining off. And also, it just allows for too much exploitation of the trophy track. In fact, when you combine the B sides of the boards with the like dodgy story, storytelling max track rule and the fact that the market replenishes after every tile you take from it, it causes a stupid amount of swinginess with the chaining of combos. My friend had the best quote ever for this. He said that when we, we played a game called Gollum, all right, the one from Cranio Creations, and he said, this was a quote, right, when I make a combo in Gollum, I feel clever. When I make combos in Stroganov, I feel sad. Now, that at the time floored me out of my chair. I was laughing my head off with that. And I knew I had to like steal that quote from it. But don't worry, I'll play on royalties in some way. Maybe I'll buy a beer. But it felt that way with Stroganov. You got to a point where the amount of swinginess that came from those combos and the downtime to wait for the turn to end just got ridiculous with that stuff. So now I have to say, Always use the A side of the boards. Use the house rule to say that the market doesn't replenish after every tile. And it's an easy house rule to put in. I mean, it's not like it breaks the game to use that rule. It improves it. I'm, I'm positive that it will shave 10 minutes off your game as a result. But yeah, I kind of feel like I've had to put in a few design tweaks to kind of get this the way it was. And I just do not believe that those B sides were play tested properly. I really don't. Yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. There are a lot of different paths to victory. If you want to go for outposts, then you can do your advanced actions a bit more easily in the future. But then you could try and spam storytelling like crazy. You could collect a ton of furs and use them to claim landscape tiles all the time. You could decide maybe, you know what, those Tsar Wish cards are cool. I could build up some cool little combo abilities and then some end game scoring. There's a lot of different ways to play. Even down to the whole moving across Siberia itself is pretty sweet. Because the first person, the person to the right of the track is the one who goes first. So people are moving at different paces along that road, a bit like in parks, if you've ever played that one. And so you're kind of thinking, well, hang on, do I hang back and use this tile when there's more furs on it, or I could claim it for cheap? Or do I race ahead so I can go first in subsequent rounds and maybe get access to some other like tiles and furs at that end? Honestly, I never found myself caring too much about going across the whole of Siberia though. Occasionally I wanted, say, in a two-player game to go first, but in a three or four-player game, I just sort of felt like, 
well, I'm not that desperate to get to the end of the Siberia track. I mean, the, the landscape tiles don't get significantly better when you get to the end of Siberia, apart from a tiger tile. You get a couple of story point bonuses if you happen to be at the end, and of course you go first in the next round when you go over the admin phase, but these these bonuses don't seem like the best thing ever. It's really more just down to, do you want to be the first to take a song tile, in which case, get to the front of the track. But I've got to extend this segment and talk about the solo mode, because I mentioned earlier that playing this with three or four players does take the game to a bit of a stupidly long segment here. The solo mode, however, is really good. Credit to the solo mode design, because with this one, you basically just have a bunch of little automata cards, you flip one over and then you read like stage one, two and three, and that's how the automata acts, Ivan or whatever you want to call them. And that's a really simple thing to do. The actions that they do are straightforward, they're not that overcomplicated, there's very little priority diagrams here. You have one, I think you basically just have one priority diagram in terms of the furs that it uses, and that's really easy to memorize. Apart from that, flip the card, do their turn. Sometimes they can't do their turn because they don't have the furs available, in which case the turn's even simpler in that regard, and you get on with your own turn. And so you can finish a solo mode of this in about 60 odd minutes, 90 tops if you're going to think about it hard, but honestly, an hour you could get this done in solo, and it feels nigh on identical to a two-player game. Honestly, yeah, the human player will probably make some better decisions over time because the automata even though you can customize them like in the start of the game to say, right, I'm going to focus a lot on trophies or Zara cards based on what cards you take out of the deck, the, the automata does make some dumb decisions every now and again where I'm like, look, you've moved to this tile. If you just simply hunted for an extra token, you could claim that tile. But because the card says it only claims one token, not two, it doesn't get a chance to buy the landscape tile. And you just think, oh, if a human was there, it would do better. But that's not to say that it's a cakewalk. You still have to pay attention to what you're doing to beat it in its easy mode, but it is beatable, fairly beatable. You can tweak the difficulty in various ways, and I highly recommend you use the first difficulty modifier, which is that if it can't afford it because it hasn't got the furs, let it get a coin because it uses coins in order to make them wild, and I think it just needs that little bit of a nudge, a little bit of a nudge, a little bit of a kick just to get it into high gear and make it a challenging solo. But yeah. The solo mode is so quick, so easy, so fast, it's just really good solo mode. And as such, I have to think, why would I bring this out with three or four players? Two player is very quick, still fun, there's a bit more back and forth with who's in front with the Cossacks and that, but it does pretty much the same game as a three or four player, just with less downtime. And the solo mode is next to no downtime with dealing with the automata, and yet you still get all the fun of the main game, of getting all the furs, deciding which path to victory I want, outposts, landscape tiles, czar cards, all of that is in the game. There's just a tiny amount of difference for how many automata are in. Why would I play this with four ever again? I really don't know. This is why Superman works alone. Okay, I hope you're enjoying the video, and I'm sorry to break it up, but if I could just borrow a minute of your time. We all like a fully stocked shelf like this for the games, right? And if we see an empty shelf, it affects us in different ways. Okay, some more over the top than the others, but you don't have to get into that situation. That's because the new sponsor for this channel is kiender.co.uk. They've got the new hotness, some hidden gems, and even stock sleeve kings, which you would have heard me talk about a lot on my videos. They do discounts for really bold purchases, as well as free next day shipping if you spend £30 or more. And I'm going to give you, the viewers, a little bit of a nudge too. If you sign up for an account with their website and use the referral code to the side here, or the link in the description below, you'll be able to get a 5% discount on your first purchase over £60. So that's 5% off and free next day delivery on your first purchase of £60 or more across their website range. So don't fall into the trap of empty spaces, grab some games, save some money and be proud of a fully stocked shelf. Thank you for listening, I really appreciate it, and now, back to the content. Get on with it. Now as we get onto aesthetics, first of all let me stipulate, this is the retail version of the box. I am aware that there's a bit of controversy at the moment with the deluxe version on Kickstarter where apparently the quality of that has not really met the like, expectations of players. Not involved in that, not my deal, this is a retail box. 
The components are a little bit flimsy though. The card quality is not particularly great. The tile, the tiles themselves are fine. The landscape tiles are cool. I like them, they're quite chunky and cool. But the fur tiles are very small. They're a little bit on the thin side, but you know, they shouldn't break apart. The board is a little bit on the weird side as well. There's a lot of little, not creases, but you know, when you lay it out flat, you'll notice that it's got a little bit of like, I don't know, like poor production quality in certain fold areas. And it's really annoying because normally you would just slide the landscape tiles across the board in order to refill it, but you can't because these little divots effectively get in the way and stop you doing that. So a little bit of a weird production quality issue there, but cannot talk enough praise about the artwork. The artwork in this is stellar. Uh, Magique Janique, I have no idea if I pronounced that name right, but you know, I've looked over his work and he's done some interesting stuff there in, in terms of art and all particularly good. Although, gotta say, I was surprised that this is the same guy who did Preda Porter's artwork. If you remember that from Portal Games, that third edition that looks absolutely beautiful with all that watercolor style artwork, well, that is all over this. That cover already looks great. The board itself, white background. I love boards with white backgrounds because it's stark and everything pops when it's color. But you've got beautiful landscapes, you've got beautiful tiles, uh, even the cards themselves are pretty good. The graphic design is clear. I, I cannot talk enough praise about the artwork. I just wish the components kind of met, like, rose up to match that artwork. But that being said, the components are not terrible. They're just nothing particularly special, whereas the artwork is. So, kudos, uh, Magic. You know, can we have you doing more stuff, please? Now, sadly, the theme isn't quite all there. I mean, it's a cool setting. I like the fact that it's gone to that sort of 16th century Cossack area, because there's not a lot of games that have done that. And with this one, I feel like, oh, cool, setting great. But when it boils down to it, it's mainly just a setting, not really thematic to what it is you're doing. You're marching across all these different tiles, you're grabbing all sorts of weird, like, fur based on whether you can spend money to hunt more often. I'm not quite sure how that works. But then also, you know, you've got the market and then you've got a storytelling track, which apparently it sings songs if you uh, hunt a bear. I mean, forget the fact that you can hunt lynxes and honey badgers and all this stuff and, like, you know, elk and tigers, but apparently you get story points for hunting a bear? What's so special about that? But, you know, when you play this game, it doesn't really feel like the theme is coming straight out at you. This is definitely a mechanical game in every right, and so make certain you're aware of that. The problem is, is that the theme, like the box and the art cover, sorry, the cover art, kind of lure you into a false sense by thinking, oh yeah, this is going to be a really thematic game, you know, but nah, this is kind of akin to something like Scythe, you know, Scythe's got this sort of gorgeous artwork as well, it looks beautiful on the table, but when you boil it down, it is mainly just an efficiency engine. Here, it's basically a Euro game. Now longevity, this one does take a little bit of a hit here, because there really isn't that much here. You know, you do have the different paths to victory. So you will get several games where you think, you know what, I'm gonna focus on Outpost, so now I'll focus on the trophy track, now I'll focus on landscape tiles. But apart from that, there's not really a lot of differentiation with the setup. Yeah, you can argue, oh, well, I'll take a different starting card and the landscapes come out in different order. Big whoop, it's not really that big a difference if like two forest tiles end up coming out like quite early in the in the sequence. Oh, now it's two mountain. It, really doesn't feel like it changes much. The market doesn't really change in how it works, nor does the storytelling aspect. It's just a case of where do the village tiles end up? Where do the yurt tiles end up? And yeah, you can create some instances where it's like, oh, I can do the trophy track nearer to the start now. But again, it doesn't really feel like much of a change. As I say, the asymmetric boards can burn in hell as far as I'm concerned. Do not use them. So you are using generic boards, you know, for your player setup. Really, if this didn't have the solo mode in it, I think it would actually struggle to come off the shelf as much as it should based on the limited replay value. But having the solo mode in there does mean that if you can't get the multiplayer opponents, you do have a very solid way to play the game. In fact, probably more often this way than you will play multiplayer. And, you know, the puzzle aspect is still fun. But yeah, I would have just liked a little bit more differentiation, certainly much better asymmetric powers, but I don't know, just a, a way to really change up how that board can look. But as it said, it's a little bit of variety, but you will see a lot of those story tiles, you know, in one game. You'll see quite a fair few of the Tsar wish cards in one game. And, you know, there's only so many starting cards and most of these cards are just 
basic, you know, what, you know, get you points for X, you know, nothing particularly fancy. But, as I say, it's not like you're going to get bored in your second game, mainly because of the past to victory in solo mode, but just, yeah, just bear that in mind. So overall, Stroganov is a bit of a hit and miss affair, but mostly hit. You know, the duration is a problem when you get to three and four players, and certainly I gotta bring the mark down on that respect. But it has a great solo mode that is just easy to use and gives you the flavor of the game in, in a nutshell. But then two player is still fun. The rules are not particularly complex to learn other than those little blemishes where they're like confusing references for these certain rules. The gameplay itself, we're trying to manage this little puzzle of the furs and deciding which path to victory to go for, how far along the tile you're going, taking the opportunities of, oh, that tile's a bit cheaper to acquire. Maybe now the time, that is still engaging. The artwork is beautiful even if the component quality doesn't quite match it. No, I wish it, there was more of a theme, but you know, that's just the way with Euro games these days. It's all about looks as opposed to theme. And yeah, the longevity is hurt a little bit, but I can still see a lot of people enjoying this. And I can certainly see like a, a definite argument for grabbing this if you are intending to play it mainly solo and two player. I think if three and four player is your game, it's probably gonna suffer a little bit too much or you're gonna think for this length of the game, I'd probably rather pull out something like maybe like the Viscounts and Architects games for that kind of level. So it does a good job, but it falls shy of greatness. And overall, I think I'm giving this one a seven out of 10, providing you play this solo and two player. I think I would drop it down to a six if you are talking three or four player, frankly, but I've enjoyed my time with this and I might hang on to it for a little bit for the solo play. But again, that longevity is kind of an issue, I must admit. But, like I say, it's a decent game. I think it's just going to be a case of how much you're willing to pull up with that downtime, how much you're, like, you know, caring about the lack of asymmetrical powers. But if you enjoy what I've been describing in terms of the gameplay mechanics, this could be a solid hit for you. So, by all means, check it out if it's up for you. That's it for me. I'll see you on the next Broken Meeple video. Remember, if you like the content, remember to subscribe to the channel and like the video and comment on it with your thoughts on Stroganoff or anything else that's been mentioned in this video. Because I like to appreciate that you watch this content but I like to hear your thoughts as well even if I can't always reply to a comment I will do my best to. Until next time you can check out more content on the channel including the live top 10 I did with Johnny from the Hexy Beast about our worst things in our favorite games and if you like more live streams well then you can check out the one I did with Boardroom Gamer the other week where we talk about games that hooked us from day one. Take care and remember as always it's only a game. Bye for now.